Welcome to Salon Talks. My name is Ashley Stevens, and I am here today with Kenny Gilbert. Uh, you probably recognize him. You've seen him on Top Chef. He has beaten Bobby Flay. He is a restaurant owner, and he sells his own spices, Chef Kenny's Spices. Um, and he's also coming out with a great new cookbook called Southern Cooking Global Flavors. It publishes in April. Kenny, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So from the jump, I wanted to talk about how beautiful the organization of this book is, where for people who obviously haven't seen it at this point, it's divided up into sections centered around um, sort of traditional Southern dishes, so fish and grits or um, meatloaf and mashed potatoes, which was my favorite section. Um, and they all include a twist, though. So for instance, like in the meatloaf and mashed potatoes section, there's shawarma spiced lamb meatloaf with feta and um, mashed potatoes. And I, I was curious, you know, what can people expect when they cook this book? And also, how did you determine that that's how you wanted to organize it? Um, well, what they can expect is to get some very basic um, Southern preparations and dishes uh, that basically, you know, speak to my heart and kind of my upbringing uh, growing up and whatnot. Um, and then also it, each chapter will take you on a journey through through my lens of my experiences with other cultures, um, through friends, family, uh, you know, co-workers uh, and just breaking bread and just talking about like, hey, what did you eat when you were growing up? Um, like, you know, kind of like doing the sound check earlier, like, hey, what'd you have for breakfast? Right, it's, right. It's, like, it's literally, it literally kind of came about like that. Um, I wanted to be able to share my experiences through, uh, through, you know, common foods people can relate to. Definitely. Um, speaking of breaking bread with people, I noticed that your mom, she pops up a lot in the cookbook from the introduction to the meatloaf recipe that I loved to the dessert section. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about what your relationship with her, how that maybe played a role in your cooking, and then also maybe how she framed cooking for you as a as a young man or as a boy. Yeah, I was I was very fortunate that you know my mom, you know she had she had two boys, you know me and my brother, uh, my brother Kirk, who's also a chef. Ironically, um, we you know she she nurtured us, you know anything that we she saw that we actually had an interest in. She just nurtured that talent. If you know we wanted to play a sport, if we were swimming, if I was swimming a lot, she's like, okay, cool, you're gonna swim, and as long as you want to do it, great. In terms of cooking, I was always by her side. You know, as she was walking around the house, and when she was cooking, you know, meals, I was right there paying attention. Uh, and uh, she just was uh, a very warm. She's a very warm and friendly person, but very firm at the same time. You know, she raised two boys. You know. You know, very fairly, and I, 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 I contribute my whole career really towards her, her, her nurturing um, ability to to teach. Um, you know, she's you know, I taught uh, she taught me how to scramble my first egg at three years old, and then she also taught me how to clean, um, and and to be you know pay attention to safety and things like that. So uh, it really, you know, my whole whole career has really been shaped around um, her starting that time with me back when I was a little, you know, a little boy. Now, I loved this statement that you made in the book where she was um, like intent upon making you guys self-sufficient as men where you could cook and you could clean. And, um, you know, I think that things are definitely shifting in that regard. But um, I know that in my family, that wasn't always the case. So it's really refreshing to see, you know. Um, well, and speaking of, of your home life, there was a statement in your book introduction that really grabbed me. You said, every American has their own food culture at home. I was hoping that maybe you could expand upon that a little bit. And then maybe there were some examples from your childhood that come to mind that were sort of specific to your home food culture. Yeah, you know, I, my mom is from the South. Um, and so, uh, and my dad is from the Midwest. So in, in our household, you know, my dad being from Chicago, my dad being from San Augustine, Florida, you know, there were two different perspectives um, still, even in a black uh, family that uh, that was based around food and the idea and the idea of what we should be eating during different meal periods and not really realizing what was going on. It's like all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're having, you know, you know, cornbread dressing, and maybe this dressing uh, had uh, oysters in it. And then this, you know, then we'll also have a shrimp perlo, 
um, you know, uh, rice dish, you know, dish and sound to the South. And, um, you know, it, a lot, I started to realize that I talked to her more about food. It was all based on like, oh, well, this is what I had when I was one of this little girl. And then my dad, uh, you know, very well traveled and whatnot, you know, was more meat and potatoes. Mm -hmm. um, um, and also would expand on, to try different things from, from, from other, uh, you know, ethnicities and cultures uh, around the city by trying different restaurants and stuff. So, you know, growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, suburb of Euclid, actually, you know, we we had these neighborhood pockets, you know, um, and, you know, I was a swimmer as a kid and like being on a swim team and having friends and just spending a night over a friend's house, you know, by the friend I've been, you know, white kid that was Italian, you know, me opening up the refrigerator and seeing what was in their refrigerator was way different than what was in mine. And, and so uh, just throughout, you know, just growing up, I just, I associated what my friends looked like and what their cultural influence was like to related to food, yeah. you know, and, and it all kind of, you know, that's how the dots kind of connected for me. See, I really love that because I think sometimes food media, it tends to dismiss like the idea of like fusion cooking is a trend. And something that I was, I was curious about reading through this book is whether you consider the dishes that you've created to be, fusion cuisine are they something else like what how do you classify them we classify it as you know like kind of like i just mentioned my mom was from the south and she you know raised me up in ohio and so to be up there it's like she was craving some things that are southern but the her ingredients around here were very midwestern so she wasn't able to get like grouper and mahi mahi and things that, or a local Mayport shrimp that's very regional to the South. So she adapted um, the flavors that she wanted to enjoy based on the ingredients that were around there. So like I grew up eating a lot of say fried perch uh, or, you know, things like that. And so like what if she wanted to have fried green tomatoes and fish with grits and whatever it was like oh, okay well, we're gonna get some perch or we're gonna get some pike right. that was that's what i had whereas if i'm down in the south and say a person is a transplant from new york and you know and you know northern italian american and all of a sudden but they love all of a sudden they get i had a love for biscuits yeah. uh, but they wanted flavors that they can relate to uh, other than a basic buttermilk biscuit and like you know what but i love i love chicken parm but I love a biscuit, you know, why can't I make a biscuit in that has the flavors of the Parmesan and garlic and everything that they has. And so that's kind of how I did it. I more so looked at like who we are as people and families and these, this whole melting pot of, of families, like, but we're embedded in the South. If you're craving oxtails and you love the basic oxtails, but Maybe your husband or wife or whoever is Filipino and they love oxtails too, but they wanted to have some flavors that they grew up having. Why can't we make those oxtails, you know, like an adobo style uh, versus a classic Southern or a Guyanese pepper pot style? Um, so that's kind of how it all came about. I really wanted to have some of those common dishes um, where they could be a flex. You could, you could twist it and actually, uh, add, you know, take a couple of these ingredients out and put these other ingredients in. I wanted to show the diversity of yeah. the dishes and the commonality of it. No, that makes sense. And there were a couple of dishes that I wanted to highlight, um, partially just selfishly, because I've already put them on my menu. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to talk about them with you. Um, but the, the first one, it's your meatloaf and mashed potatoes. And there's this step that I thought might be noteworthy to home cooks where you actually um, blend the vegetables before you, could you talk me through, uh, just a little bit, um, one, how you came to do that and two, kind of what it offers the dish in terms of texture and flavor. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, a classic meatloaf, a lot of times you have this ground beef and then it's like, oh, let's take some peppers and onions and maybe celery and throw it all in and kind of mix it in and, and you bake it off. And then when this meatloaf is baked off, you put like a glaze of ketchup on it and you slice it. Then you see these chunks of peppers and onions in there. I never really liked that. I felt like I wasn't always, I felt like I was being cheated of the vegetables throughout the bite. And so I said, well, why not take these vegetables and puree it up and then fold it in? And that way every bite I'm getting, 
equally balanced flavors that, you know, with purpose, you know, if I wanted to put celery and garlic and so on and so forth in there, then I want to taste it through every bite with the meat versus having hints of different chunks. So it was, it was one, uh, it, because I, I didn't like the chunks in it. Uh, two, in a, in a restaurant setting, when you're cutting up a bunch of vegetables, it's a lot faster also for me to take my trinity, my pepper, celery, and, and, and onions, puree it up with some garlic and some herbs, have that base. With, and then I say, okay, cool. I need to have eggs in here too. I can puree all that up together and then add it in. Um, and I don't mind having to sit there and slice and dice all these vegetables up. I can cut it up in bigger chunks, wash the vegetable really nice, puree it up, and then add it. So it was a, it was two part. One, I didn't like the individual chunks. And then two, it made it more streamlined and faster to, to execute larger batches of, of, of uh, products. Well, that ties into the next recipe that I wanted to talk about. It's the miso honey glazed salmon with bamboo rice grits, because I feel like this is a good example of a dish that feels um, when I saw it, I'm like, oh, this feels very fancy. But then I started reading and I'm like, oh, this is something that's actually totally doable on a weeknight as well. Um, I was hoping that you could maybe walk me through the development of that dish because um, it just jumped off the page. So, again, I, I'm tr I've been very fortunate that I travel abroad, um, cook a lot of things, eat a lot of different things. And um, I love a good at one point I was um, I, at Stajo in Japan. Um, I have a lot of friends that, that you know, are Chinese American and whatnot. And I love the idea of like, say, the rice porridge or uh, kanji um, or um, rice grits. You know, it's kind of almost the same thing. It's kind of this neutral base that you can, you know, place something on and that actually has more flavor to enhance. And I felt like the bamboo rice um, grits would be something, again, unique, uh, one to get that those kind of rice. Um, and, but the technique of cooking it is very simple. If you can make a bowl of grits, you know, a pot of grits, you can make this dish. It's very, very easy. You're not worrying about the rice being cooked perfect. You want the rice to break down, have some texture, uh, but it, it have a very creamy finish to it. Um, and then as far as the fish, you know, some of the, you know, you know, if you go to like a Nobu or something like that, where the original kind of miso uh, you know, cod was kind of, or sable fish was kind of introduced. Um, I wanted to have something that I think that the that the, the home cook could actually um, execute very easily that has good flavor. It's a very simple recipe, a matter of just mixing up uh, some miso and honey, a little sake, whatnot, season it up and let the fish marinate in that. And you want to actually have a fatty fish. So sa salmon being very common for a lot of times people will buy and have at home, I thought it'd be a very, uh, a very good uh, pairing um, that would be relatable if you wanted to kind of go in more of an Asian direction in terms of flavor profiles. Yeah. So speaking of relatability, let's say that somebody is coming to this book and they're like, you know what? Um, I'm really wanting to starting. I'm really wanting to start to cook for other people, but I feel maybe a little restricted when it comes to my skills in the kitchen. What would be maybe some novice recipes from your book that you'd be like, all right. If you're just getting started, here's a good place to start. You know, I taught a lot of cooking classes um, throughout my career. Um, I was with the Ritz Carlton for a long time, and I used to teach a, a cooking class program the second Tuesday and Wednesday of the month. And I did it for years and years and years. Um, so for me to finally be able to write a cookbook was like, I felt like I've already done it a million times by the amount of recipes I've already created for these classes and curriculum. Um, but, you know, it's, that's, that's a hard question. I guess I'll have to ask, you know, I guess the question for me would be what, what is it, what steps are they at? Are they super, super entry level basic? Um, I think that the drop biscuits and the fried chicken it surprisingly are, it, are is a good chapter. Uh, because it teaches you how to make a good drop biscuit. The drop biscuits, yeah, the drop biscuit, so it's teaching you how to bake um, and fry, two very basic techniques. Um, and it kind of walks you through the process of how you can season the chicken, how you can dredge the chicken, um, and then also how you can take these basic ingredients, so self-rising flour and some buttermilk and melted butter. And, and mine has a little bit more ingredients in there, but it will show you how to make something that is very simple if you kind of like that 
that red lobster kind of cheesy, uh, soft, buttery biscuit. That's a drop style biscuit. And so I, I, I wanted to introduce that because a lot of people are doing, doing laminated doughs or laminated biscuits that are layered with the, the chilled butter and everything, and which is great. But I figured that this would be a good a good way to start, and then also evolve to other flavor profiles. So that's I think that's a good chapter to start because sometimes people are intimidated by a biscuit and they're intimidated by fried chicken. And so I did a cooking class during uh, COVID um, for a couple. Uh, the the husband bought um, you know paid for me to do a Zoom cooking class, uh, and I didn't realize where they're from. All of a sudden, we got on the call. And she's Indian and he's English. And they, it was actually there in London. They were in London. We we're literally doing a Zoom call all you know across the country, so cool. you know, the world. And and uh, it's funny because I was showing them how to do my mom's fried chicken. And so I had some you know basic spices that we take for granted that are here. Like you know, it's like oh, give me some lemon pepper. Here's some Lori season salt, stuff like that. And I'm like, well, we didn't we don't have those spices here yeah, specifically. Yeah. And then when I was looking, when I you know I sized them up and I was like. Well, do you have any um, Madre's curry powder? Do you have any ground masala? Do you have any fenugreek? Do you have any ground cumin or ground coriander? I always already, already assumed just by looking at the family dynamic what the core basics were going to be in their pantry because of the ethnicity, you know, the cultural background. And sure enough, she had all those spices. I said, okay, I'm going to show you the technique of how to cook the fried chicken, but the flavors are going to be identifiable because of the spices you have in your pantry. And and it went off without, you know, without a hitch. And, and, um, and that's kind of how this, this whole thing came about as well. Like, so like that, that, that she, he bought that for her because she was a good, a decent cook, but never did fried chicken or expand upon biscuits. And I said, well, this is a good recipe. This, this drop biscuit is very easy, you know, um, and the, the fried chicken is easy as well. Well, and what I love about this, and you're really clear about this in the book, is that you encourage readers. It's like, okay, you can do the same thing that I'm doing. You can take the stuff from your background and your pantry and apply it. And I think that that's going to be really exciting for a lot of people because, you know, I think that you you said it, but it's like, I think people approach some specific dishes with some fear like the idea of like oh i'm gonna make biscuits or i'm gonna fry chicken in my kitchen but you giving them permission to essentially play around with what they already know how to do i think is really really exciting um so slightly different direction but um i was talking with one of my producers this morning and we were joking that we were going to meal prep for next week but we were just going to use all of your mac and cheese recipes just you know like a week of mac and cheese um how how did you take something that like I think everybody thinks that they have like this is the perfect mac and cheese recipe and then start to riff on that like was that a tough process was that a fun process what did that look like for you you know the way my brain works is just like it, whatever I'm thinking about if I'm talking to one of my best friends who's Italian and we're talking food I'm like you know and I want to cook for him and I want him to have something that's kind of like that warm hug from grandma, but his grandma, but also from my side of things, you know, in terms of listen, make a good mac and cheese and some, you know, chicken or whatever. Uh, I, I, I transport myself into that realm. And then I think about all the core basics of flavor profiles, whether it's the cheese, whether it's the, the type of pasta that would be more relatable um the chicken that's going with it um how am i going to season that the compliment and so that's how that all kind of came about i wanted something that would be unique because if you're a mac and cheese lover you're going to be like oh cool like there's wait a minute there's more than one variation that's that's i, I don't understand that I'm not that was my response i know i was so <laughs> taken aback where i'm like there's this thing that i love so much and there's so many ways to prepare it which is it's it's an exciting prospect. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. So yeah, and, I, and so for me, I wanted to be able to show like, hey, this is my basic foundation of how I make mac and cheese, and then now you can take uh, th these cheeses out, add these cheeses in, and then now you have a different experience, and and you can pair that up with different proteins or vegetables or whatever. So uh, I knew that that was a fun that was a fun chapter um, because I knew that people would definitely vibe off of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
Um, so speaking of flavor profiles, you mentioned in your cookbook that your fried chicken recipe is tailored to the palate of Oprah Winfrey. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, my original fried chicken, I learned how to make with my mom. You know, she would take chicken and wash it in the sink with, you know, some cold water and then season it up, have the can of iron skillet going, flick a little flour in there, see that it's bubbling, and then put the flour on the chicken, let it get a little tacky, flour one more time, fry. Rotate, rotate, rotate. Um, fast forward to me having the opportunity to cook for um, Oprah Winfrey for a, a good friend of mine was her personal chef for years. You know, I've been cooking for her since 2014. Um, so the first time I had an opportunity to cook fried chicken for her uh, was uh, the – uh, leading into the new year, it was actually New Year's of uh, 2015. Uh, we were doing kind of a classic Southern, um, you know, New Year's Day uh, dinner, and uh, we wanted we had fried chicken, we had you know collard greens, black eyed peas, and all that. It was my first time frying chicken for her, and Art Smith, who was her previous personal chef, you know, had the best fried chicken that she ever had for a long time, and so. We wanted to try to beat that impression. You know, that was a goal. It was like, we want you to say, we love your fried chicken. That that was, I wanted to hear it, to hear it from her mouth. Um, and after frying, after prayer over the table, um, she was like, hey, you know, Sted, Stedman, you need to finish off that uh, prayer a little bit faster. I hear that chicken crackling in the back. And uh, when we were done, we pulled the chicken and we had out there on a beautiful display and Kirby was the first person to eat a bite of fried chicken, Gail's daughter. And she was like, oh, my gosh. And everyone was like, what? What happened? She was like, this has to be the best fried chicken I've ever had in my life. And and then Ms. Winfrey was like, oh, is it better than Art's? <laughs> and I was on the carving. I was I had a beautiful smoked ham, and I was on the car, carving the ham and whatnot. And uh, and then and Kirby was like, oh, yeah. And, um, and ironically, Art has just done a beautiful – we did a beautiful event uh, weeks prior. And so it was fresh in everyone's mind. Yeah. And so Mr. Graham he had the fried chicken and he took it a bite. Like, oh, no, Oprah, you need to try this fried chicken. And she, you know, she's just an amazing hostess. And she waited for everyone to kind of go through kind of this beautiful buffet we had and start eating before she went in. And um, she then got a piece of, you know, fried chicken thigh. And then, uh, I, you know, she sat down. And she had like a little bit of peas and greens. And I said, Ms. Winfrey, was like, any hot sauce? And she was like, if it needs it, I'll grab it. And I was like, oh, oh man. Like, so can I made all these homemade hot sauces with peppers from her garden? And she took a bite and she loved it. And she said, she looked at me. She said, Kenny, you did all this, right? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, you know, all my years, the 60 years I've been on this earth, this has to be one of the best Southern meals I've ever had in my life. And um, thank you very much, you know, for sharing your passion uh, with us and everyone clapped and everything. And then from that point on, every time there was an event, um, usually she would ask me to come out and do fried chicken and biscuits and stuff like that. So for the last, you know, eight, nine years now, that's that's what's been happening. I, I love to like that's a real demonstration of the power of like how people can connect over a really specific dish. Um that's a great story. Yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing that. Um, kind of in that vein, um, a couple years ago, a few years ago now, you um, you beat Bobby Flay on his television show, uh, Beat Bobby yeah. Flay. And yeah. I was curious if you could talk a little bit about, you know, kind of on that day, what do you think gave you the edge? Was it a technique thing, a creativity thing? I'm assuming it was a mix of both. And are there any, is there anything that you learned from that experience that you still kind of draw on today in your cooking career? Yeah, you know, cooking competitively is uh, is is great, you know. But regardless, whoever the judges are, it's subjective, you know. Like they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna you know get the food in front of them, and then based on how they like to eat and the idea of that dish, uh, will speak to them. And and usually because they're gonna select some some judges that are. They're very well traveled and have great palates and probably restaurant tours. They they're used to eating for a living. They get it, you know. Um, that particular day, I like to say a lot of times that you know Bobby is such a talented chef, and the the ego 
of the chef to be able to say, hey, you know what, come on my show, um, try to beat me uh, with your recipe, you know, like, you know what I mean? Because that's how the show is set up. You have to beat another chef that from an ingredient that he showed, you know, basically shares. So, hey, here's okra. You know, you guys do get out on okra. And then whoever wins, tell me what your best dish is, and I'm going to beat you at that as well. That's that New York, you know, ego swag, you know, is 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 special, you know. And so for me to be able to take a dish that I feel like I make very well, which was chicken and dumplings that I have a personal connection to, um, it's going to be a lot different than his connection to yeah. it. You know, yeah. has he has he had it? Yes. Has he eaten it since he was, you know, five, six years old every thanks every pre-Thanksgiving, yeah. you know, for 12, 13 years? Probably not. Um, so I have an edge on that. Um, um, and then so for me to be able to put together something that I thought was uh, that everyone could identify to that had a little twist. Uh, that was flavorful. Um, uh, I, I felt like I had more of an edge than me competing against an Iron Chef in that particular situation. Um, I would love to be able to compete against him in an Iron Chef setting, uh, where it's truly like, "Hey, here's the ingredients. It's, it's even playing field." Um, because I felt like I had an edge on, him. and that's in, you know, again, when you're cooking against an Iron Chef, that's that's the thing. These guys are you know, more experienced. They've been cooking a little bit longer than you have. They've got a lot more accolades. You know, as many accolades as I have, you know, when he, he was, his particular, that particular episode, he, I was the last episode of this season, of the season for him. So he, he was already super warmed up. See, people don't think about that. Like he'd already competed eight episodes. You know, I was like the ninth episode or something like that. So over the course of a couple of weeks, he's already in his kitchen that he's set, that they set up based on how he likes to cook. And he's already cooked against seven or eight other chefs. Right. So he has he has an advantage. You're coming into his house cooking your dish, but he's in his house. He's on TV all the time. He's right. cooking all the time. You know what I mean? So it, it's. And competitive cooking all the time, which, like you said, is such a different thing. It's like, maybe you could talk about that a little bit for viewers, that it's like the type of cooking that they see on television. How closely does it resemble, if at all, the kind of cooking that you do in a restaurant? Is it the same? Is it wildly different? What are we looking at? You know, it, it's it's actually pretty fair, in a sense, and pretty close to a restaurant because all your cooking equipment they, they, they have you locked in. It's like, here, you already have a pot of water boiling. You already have a little fryer already at 350. Your mm -hmm. oven's already set at 350. You have plenty of burners. You have every core ingredient you can think of for dry goods, produce. Uh, so your common pantry items is, like, amazing. And it's, you know, amazing just, you know, for the, it's just amazing for that, the, the chef that you're cooking against. But they, they have a set like, these are the best ingredients. If you grab a tomato, it's going to be sweet. It's going to be beautiful. If you grab kohlrabi or a mushroom, it's going to be the best. If you need truffles, they're there. So you have even playing fields. And it's very, very close. And for some kitchens, you it more likely you're going to have more in this cooking co competitive kitchen setting than you are in your kitchen. Because if your restaurant is set up to be, you know, uh, Southern from, you know, Charleston, and you might be like a Sean Brock type, but you're not cooking with anything that is, you know, not in this particular vicinity of, because you're really, really far on the table and artisanal. When you see something that's like, oh man, I'm not used to getting this kind of mushroom here or whatever, that could trip you up a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, they're the best ingredients out there. And that's the great part about it. And your equipment is, you have everything you need. You know, you might have an anti griddles over here. You're gonna have a pocket. You know, uh, you know, you're gonna have ice cream, a carpet Gianna ice cream machine over here. You're gonna have a circulator already set. You're gonna have you got liquid nitrogen around the corner. You're gonna have a lot of the bells and whistles. Yeah, yeah. Um, to bring it back to the book, and this is my my last question, but um, I know that everybody's pantries, like we've talked about, you know everybody has kind of a different culture that they cook from at home, but what are certain things that you make sure that you have stocked in your pantry? Like what are essentials, if you will, um, just to make sure that you can get dinner on the table uh, when you're cooking for yourself. 
So um, spice, being that I grew up cooking with a lot of spices, that was kind of my first love. Um, you know, always a plethora of spices, I mean, usually in the individual form versus the already blend. Um, so I'm always going to have a grain lady garlic, grain lady onion, uh, a nice salt, probably a couple of different types of salt, whether it's a kosher salt, whether it's a pink Himalayan salt, um, a really good black pepper, like a tell cherry black peppercorns that you can grind fresh. Um, uh, I don't mind dry herbs. So like, like sometimes dry parsley or dry dill, dry oregano, um, not necessarily dry basil. Um, olive oil, a good olive oil, um, like a pomace, so not necessarily extra virgin, something that I can cook with, uh, a neutral oil, uh, like a sapphire oil. I've been, you know, using a lot of avocado oil or I buy an oil that's associated with the culture that I'm going to be cooking with. So it's all relatable. Um, and then, uh, vinegars, uh, usually apple cider vinegar, a balsamic, a white vinegar, um, self-rising flour, usually sugar. Grain lady white sugar, brown sugar, um, some kind of syrup, uh, usually cane syrup, because I grew up eating an alibi cane syrup uh, with my mom, using molasses, honey. So I usually have like two or three of of every kind of section there. So my pantry is pretty vast. Um, but that's the, those those are the core. Like if I have that, um, and then I just need to go to the store and buy fresh produce and uh, some proteins. I usually can go from there. You know, pasta, pasta, rice. You know, I prefer jazz and rice. Um, usually always some grits, you know, nice stone ground. I might even have some quick grits in there just to cheat if I want to have like that nostalgic yeah. cooking with my mom kind of really quick, quick grit versus the one that takes like 30 minutes. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Um, well, again, Kenny Gilbert, uh, he is the author of Southern Cooking Global Flavors, which publishes this April. Uh, Kenny, thank you so much for being with us today. No, thanks for having me.